How would you like to do church like Jesus did? Over the past few years, we've learned that church can happen in a very meaningful way outside of a church building. In fact, we're getting raving reviews from our house churches, which are now over 100. Though I thank God for churches in buildings and on campuses, God is leading more and more people these days to gather for church in their homes. Not only is it easier for many people to attend a house church, but a house church can offer a level of community that campuses can't. Well, I'm excited to announce that every Thursday in December and January, I plan to host a house church interest meeting on Zoom at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. If you're not attending a church right now and are interested, or if you know of anyone who's interested, then all they have to do is email us at hcinfo at solidlives.com or click the link in the description of this video. Okay, now let me welcome you to the New Testament Daily with Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. I'd appreciate it if you'd help others find this resource by sharing the link, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay, now let's pray, and we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that it's inspired. I pray that each person watching or listening today will hear what you have to say to them through your Word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Luke chapter 19. Here's what it says. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Oh, here's the famous story. Who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, oh, don't you love this? He looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Oh, I'm pretty sure that's a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. He didn't just pick somebody out of the crowd off the top of his head that the Holy Spirit was tipping him off. This man is ready. This man is hungry. Well, we know that because he wanted to see Jesus, the Bible says, and he ran ahead, climbed up a tree just to be able to see him. So Zacchaeus had some hunger. Well, let's see what happens. Verse 6. So he made haste and came down and received him, received Jesus joyfully. In other words, welcomed Jesus into his house. But when they saw it, it, it says, when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Now, why did they say he's a sinner? Well, because he's not only a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. Tax collectors were considered by the Jews to be sinners. Why? Because they were used by the Romans, and it's believed that these were Jewish people who were chosen by the Romans to collect the taxes from their own people. And the Romans were really overtaxing the Jewish people, and it made their lives hard. And so a tax collector was like a sellout, like you're a traitor, you're just, you know, in it for the money. And, uh, you know, you're working for the Romans, but you're being used to strip us. Well, somebody was going to do it. If the Romans didn't have the Jews do it, the Romans would have uh, Romans do it or somebody else. But nonetheless, it is possible, maybe even likely, that these Jewish people that were willing to be tax collectors, hey, they cared more about the money than the oppression that was on their people. But this now is a chief tax collector. So this would be, if there was any dispute or any appeal for mercy for anybody, it would go to this person who likely had denied many requests. So it says that the people around uh, said, uh, they complained because they said, uh, you have gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And verse 8 says, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, now listen to this, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to, to the poor. 
And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. This man has been impacted already uh, by the ministry of Jesus, whether he has heard him before or not, or maybe he was hearing him talk at his house. But this man, you can tell, is ready to be saved because unlike the rich young ruler who didn't want to let go of his possessions, Zacchaeus is offering without Jesus even directly asking him. He's saying, I'll give half my goods to feed the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold, four times as much as I took. Wow. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So notice the change of behavior, the change of lifestyle, the change of heart, the change of priorities uh, being vocalized to Jesus told Jesus, okay, this man has had a change of heart. This man is receiving the gospel that I'm preaching, and he's receiving it to the point of action, changing his lifestyle, repenting from his lifestyle, and headed toward a new lifestyle. Well, that's what it takes. That's why Jesus went around preaching, repent, not just pray a prayer. No, repent, turn from the way you've been living to a new way of living, and that's exactly what Zacchaeus was doing. Verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they sought the kingdom of God, excuse me, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Uh, like I said uh, several times, the Jewish people, and, and this would include the scribes, the Pharisees, those that studied the Old Testament, which would have been their entire Bible at that point, they knew Messiah was coming based on the text of the scripture, but they didn't know there would be two comings. So what they were trying to grapple with is if you're the Messiah, why are you not setting up the kingdom of God? So they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So it goes on to say, therefore, he said to them, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Of course, this nobleman represents Jesus. Verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas. I love this parable. Every one of the 10 got the same amount, a mina. It's a measure of money. They got 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. Notice, your mina has earned 10. 10 minus. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. Isn't that interesting? Your one mina has earned 10. So that means that he has 11. See, but the first one came from the master. So he said, well, put him over 10 cities. Why? Because he knows how to take something that's small and develop it, multiply it, increase it. So we want to put him over something large so that that can increase. Put him over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in, the, in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Now, let me first say that what this man is saying is not true because this master did deposit. This master did so. He started each person with a mina. He didn't ask them to go figure out how you're going to have some money to start trading with. No, he is the one that gave them the money. But this guy has a wrong perception. 
and this is how many people are today, they have a perception that God has not invested into us. And if you'll give me something, then I'll do something with it. The Lord has given you so much. He's given you your life. He created you. He's given you air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat. He's given you sunshine. He's given you purpose. He's given you a Bible. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you salvation uh, by the death of his son on the cross, etc., etc. God has given so much, and there are so many other things that he has added and supplied us with. And for us to give God any indication that if he would just provide more, then maybe we could do something, rather than taking more of the loaves and fish uh, principle and saying, look, even if I only have a little, I can do something with it with God's help. And so, this man said, I knew that you were an austere man. And so notice this, uh, verse 21, For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collected what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you. So notice, he's not judging the man based on the master's real character. He's judging the man based on what the man said the master was. Out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. That's what you knew. That's your perception of me. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Interesting. Some would think, well, give it to the guy with five because, or maybe one of the other of the 10 people, because this guy's already got 10. But listen to what he says. Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. But they said to him, Master, he has 10 minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Now, of course, this is a parable that is representing the Lord Jesus. And when he returns, there are going to be a lot of people that, that did not want Jesus to reign over them as Lord. They did not want to listen to him. And yet, they should. Everybody should. This is the one and only Savior. He's the creator God. And so everybody ought to submit to his lordship. But they won't. And so there's going to be some quite severe judgment when he comes a second time. This is why we've got to get out and preach the gospel and make disciples so that people know better than to live like this and act like this. Okay, verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near Bethphage uh, and Bethany that, excuse me, at the mountain called Olivet. And of course, this is on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, because on the western side of the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley that goes right up to, into Jerusalem. So it said uh, he was, he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent over two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Isn't that an interesting answer? The Lord has need of it. Uh, so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners on it, the old, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. And so evidently the colt's owners said, oh, well, okay, go ahead. And so uh, they brought him to Jesus talking about the colt, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was drawing near 
the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, of course, this is a prophetic word from the Old Testament that is specifically to be about the Messiah when he comes. And they were quoting this, in essence, declaring that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, which he is. Okay, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, the Pharisees wanted him to rebuke those people who were using that messianic prophecy on Jesus, and they were wanting him to say, oh, don't, don't use that on me. I'm not the Messiah. So they, they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Why? Because this day of me riding into Jerusalem as the king of Israel <laughs> was prophesied. This is prophecy being fulfilled. And if they didn't cry out with praise, these stones would cry out with praise. Verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, notice, in this your day. Now, that could mean a literal day, that this is the day that it was prophesied that I would ride in to Jerusalem on a donkey. I tend to believe it is that literal. But of course, sometimes you say this is your day, meaning this is your time or season. Uh, but I tend to believe this is talking about an actual day, because the prophet Daniel was given a timeline that from the decree to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, and he gave an exact amount of years that that would be. And uh, I know by one scholar's calculation, Jesus rode in on the donkey uh, that exact amount of years to the very day <laughs> the prophecy was fulfilled. Well, you know, that's not scripture. That's uh, a scholar that went and did some calculations and came up with that timeline and said it was perfect. But I have to give God some credit here because he's pretty precise. And so I don't remember reading that it had to be on the very day that those years had ended. But nonetheless, you can't put it past God that he could do things like that because he does those things all the time. Okay, so let's see. Jesus said, if you have known, he's weeping over Jerusalem, and he said, if you have had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that made for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemy will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. Of course, this is talking about what the Romans did uh, about mm, 40 years after this in 70 AD, and they burn the city. They'll close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation, because you did not know the time. See, these Jewish people who study the scriptures should have been able to look in the book of Daniel and determine about when Messiah was going to come. He said, but you still didn't know your time. Verse 45, then he went in, into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Well, people got in there and they found out that uh, the whole nation bringing sacrifices uh, every year and even during the year to the Lord. Well, that's big business. You know, it's hard to travel with certain sacrifices. So a lot of times people would bring money and then they would buy their sacrifices there in Jerusalem. So people were making quite a living off of the law, off of the worship of God, Israelite worship that was scripted in the Old Testament. And here they are, they, you know, they're just coming to the temple to do business, to make money. And oh, Jesus had a problem with that. He said, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So no doubt they were taking advantage of people 
who wanted to come and worship God. And they were saying, oh, you need the right goat or lamb or turtle doves or whatever. And they would charge him an arm and a leg because, you know, it's kind of like the gas station that's right off the freeway. The most convenient one is often the higher price one. Uh, because they can be, they get more traffic and more business. And that was certainly true about the temple. Okay, verse 47, and he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. So he was teaching daily in the temple. And the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. And they were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. All right. What a great chapter, chapter 19. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 20.